welcome to this very special launch event for The Instant by Amy Liptrot. It's fantastic to have so many people tuning in this evening and to be joined by Amy and by Lucy Jones uh, on the week of publication. Um, Amy is a best-selling multi-award winning author and tonight for 5 by 15 she's in conversation with journalist Lucy Jones, two of our favourite writers and thinkers here together. So Amy is the author of The Outrun, a nature writing classic and a Sunday Times bestseller, which was awarded the Wainwright Prize. Um, the Instant is Amy's compelling new book published by Canongate. We have fantastic, beautiful signed copies available from Newham Bookshop and Stephanie will put all the details in the chat. Lucy Jones um, is a writer and journalist. Her first book, Foxes on Earth, explored um, our account of our relationship with the fox and losing Eden took uh, Lucy from Forest Schools in East London to Svalbard Global Seed Vault to explore our changing relationship with nature. So please put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Uh, we will come to as many as we can towards the end of this session. I will disappear into the virtual wings and say a huge welcome to both Amy and to Lucy and hand over to you, Lucy. Welcome. Thank you very much, Daisy. And hello, everybody. Um, and hello, Amy. Um, it is so special to be talking to you the week um, that your new book, The Instant, is published. Um, I've followed your um, writing um, since the, the columns on Caught by the River and I adored the outrun like the probably hundreds of thousands of people across the world um, who have done too and I eagerly awaited um, your next book and um, everybody you are in for a treat. Um, I found your writing in the instant um, electric. I sat down to read it and I couldn't put it down. It felt like it was kind of glowing with energy. Um, your writing is very sensory, crisp, fresh, um, filmic, funny, consoling, um, and you make really interesting um, craft choices of form. Um, you also teach us again in the instant a lot about the world as you did in the outrun. You teach us about raccoon population dynamics. You teach us about Shizhgi, which I might be pronouncing wrong, but it's the instant when the moon and the earth and the sun are aligned. Um, you teach us words and concepts and, and behavior and about the behavior of the moon. And you also take us with you on a very intimate journey. Um, so at the end of the outrun, you are on a ferry. Um, you're watching Pape, is that how you pronounce it? Disappear over the, the horizon um, on your way to visit family. And now at the beginning of the instant, you're moving to Berlin. So I thought I might start by asking you why, what took you away from Orkney and, and what propelled you on this new adventure? Uh, hi, Lucy, hi everyone. Thank you uh, for those uh, kind words. Um, yeah, um, I moved to Berlin, um, not just not for one main reason, but uh, a lot of um, reasons. I think I just wanted another shot at, at city life. Um, I'd been back in Orkney, then after, after Papi, I moved back to the mainland for a little while. Uh, but um, I felt like I wasn't done with city life yet, and now I wanted to have a go at it sober. I'd, I'd got this really good uh, foundation uh, in my sobriety during my time in Orkney, and I felt that like there were so many opportunities open to me, and I wanted to make make the most of the world as a, as a sober person. Um, there were a few things that I kind of missed about, about city life. I, I think I missed... Um, uh, the, maybe having a bit of a peer group around me doing kind of similar things not, not that there's not that in, in Orkney but maybe people my own age like doing uh creative things and um uh working in arts in different ways uh and I kind of missed that sort of buzz and that adult life um and uh but I think the uh, uh and I thought Berlin was a good place to find this because I had a friend there and I sort of knew it's got a reputation as uh, a place where a lot's happening and a, and a sort of a cool place to be as well as a relatively um, cheap place. Uh, but the probably number one reason 
um, was that I was single and increasingly realizing that I wanted to be in a relationship. Um, and just um, statistically, I felt that that meeting people or someone would be there'd be more chance of that in the city. So it wasn't one particular reason, like a job or a, or a partner. It was just a few things came together. Um, and I got a one way ticket <laughs> and, and went out there thinking it could be for a month or uh, I had somewhere to live for a month or um, but it ended up being one year exactly to the day that I was there. And in this new environment, the first um, beings you meet off the plane are um, well, gangs of hooded crows um, <laughs> and as well as seeking human connection, you start quite immediately looking for hawks and and raccoons can you tell us a bit about the urban wildlife in berlin and particularly what you found kind of intoxicating about it well when i'd been home in orkney i definitely um got used to being really attentive to to what was around me in terms of the bird life and um uh, the natural world and I had these sort of new skills and um, a little bit of knowledge that I'd learned so I would just was I would then carry that with me wherever I went and indeed I noticed when I arrived at the airport that they were hooded crows there they weren't the the carrion crows that you get in London they're the, the grey and white uh, grey and black crows rather than you know I wouldn't have noticed that like five years previously and it, it was quite pleasing to me and it was quite satisfying that it was the same crows that you get in the north of Scotland rather than the crows that you get in um, in uh, England and I guess that just kind of exemplifies the sort of how I'd become tuned in and um, the new the new way that I had of living and there are different ways of being in a city you you can go around looking for um, for I don't know where the bar is or what the shops are selling, but you can also walk through the streets uh, listening out for bird calls or um, thinking about uh, what's going on, um, you know, in the in the cracks between the pavements. So um, uh, it's just a different way of being being of being in general. Um, but Berlin is interesting because it really has a lot of, um, of green space and a lot of in particular trees, um, which uh, um, make it a habitat for, for more animals than you might think. And I also think some of its history of having quite a lot of, um, of, of derelict places um, also has allowed um, animals to, to be there, um, including um, to my amazement, um, goshawks, which are a bird of prey that are, are very hard to find in the UK and I'd never seen one. Um, but if you have a little tiny bit of know-how, you can find them quite easily in, in the big parks in, in Berlin. Um, uh, and then I'd heard, started hearing about the fact that there were this large population of feral raccoons in the city, which are an animal that are not even native to Europe, they're an American species, um, but they had been proliferating and being very successful in, in, um, in Berlin, and this just really caught my attention, and I started um, using it as a bit, a bit of an icebreaker sometimes like when I met new people I'd kind of say have you heard about the balloons uh, the raccoons have you have you ever seen one and a lot of people had seen them and they had stories and it was it was kind of a way in to to meeting people and something to kind of just be to to give me a bit of something to guide me when I wasn't quite sure you know I didn't have a job I wasn't sure who my friends were going to be and it was a sort of um a guiding principle to my to my time in a new city Mm. Um, you went you go to quite serious lengths as well to um to try and, and see raccoons and, and hawks kind of getting up in the middle of the night and so on and I was wondering and can, correct me if I'm not phrasing this correctly but perhaps you seem to get some of the same kind of therapeutic benefit from engaging with the living world and with 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 the natural world as as you might have done from from substances um kind of before it became very dark and you see that quite a lot of people who sometimes have worked in music journalism which is 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 how you started well isn't it um then and then sometimes moving more into nature after kind of um struggles with addiction and so on and just when i was reading about these lengths you were taking i kind of wondered whether you know 
not to be trite about it, but is is there a kind of therapeutic element that is similar to the to the substances that you use to self medicate in the past? Oh, interesting um, way of looking at it. Uh, it's, I, I did a bit of getting up early in the morning when I'd sort of encounter people that were coming home from the night before, you know, being up at dawn and and I kind of thought, oh, this feels like when I'm coming home from a rave or something, but it's um, the other way around. <laughs> um, so I, and I guess it is a bit of a buzz or something, finding finding things, going out looking for things. And it, it was something I did with other people as well. I, I took friends out bird watching with me, like instead of saying, you know, come to this club or whatever, I'd be like, get out with me. Like, let's go to, let's go and try and find nightingales in the, in the bushes. Um, so I guess I had that sort of social element. Um, but maybe I think m maybe actually more, a little bit differently to that. I I know that I found these things rewarding to write about. I think that's kind of the, the crux of it. And, and I know that dusk and dawn and night times are, A, the things when, the times when it's often likely to find animals like birds and, and um, mammals are, are active at, at night or at dusk or dawn. Um, but also I, find, I found these times particularly productive to, to write about just the, the kind of what's going on with the sky and how the city changes and and um, how the light is and so yeah I guess my motivation was I'm a writer you know I'm someone that's interested in animals but or birds but I'm particularly interested in writing about birds and and getting that experience and that that image is really what motivates me as, as much as anything else. That's fascinating. Um, this might be a bit of a geeky question, but um, when you were when you were talking there, I was thinking about um, how kind of your your range of vision and your senses um, and your sensitivities to the ecologies around you um, are very kind of compelling. But do you do you find that um, when you're in a different environment, so if you're in the wilds of Orkney compared to kind of the to Berlin? Do you actually find that it um, alters your writing style or your prose or the way you think or your syntax and the kind of granular sentence level? Like do where you are in environments um, hmm. influence your, your writing on, in that way? Hmm. Um, I don't know if I've thought about it like that. I, I know that when I returned to Orkney after being in London, I think my writing got more, more sort of lyrical and um uh my uh, like my I think my voice changed but that, that was a lot to do with changes that were going on on in me ra rather than being more kind of like ironic and detached it became a bit more sort of earnest and uh, in, in a good way like more I was able to to connect more with with kind of um honesty I suppose and rather than rather than sort of having a sort of pose like you know writing for the style press or something like that um but how it changed when I was in when I was in Berlin hmm um I don't know um I don't know uh <laughs> I might have to think about that one a bit, a bit more um if the if the Berlin style is different than the yeah I'm sorry I, I'll probably think of something but um I mean you uh, have such a kind of what very formed quite singular voice so you know maybe you have this strong voice anyway that it's not kind of subject to change now because you've you know you've been writing for such a long time and um yeah you know, since you were eight isn't it your diaries um so you've had quite a lot of practice um or maybe maybe kind of to to push the question on a bit your formal experiments in the instant are really interesting and you um you kind of experiment with the text I think am I right in saying that each chapter is is a kind of extended metaphor um almost a lot a lot of them are um uh so I didn't write it in a just kind of from the beginning to the end I had some some kind of uh bodies of of the work within it already um uh, in particular I had the, the chapter that's about um going to the big techno nightclub uh Berghain, which is also uh, also about um, being underwater and I felt that that was quite successful and that kind of is a is a sort of intertwining of, of two things which is it, it, um, the, those two elements and I thought um, 
I want to try this out with some other kind of subjects that might not seem immediately like they're uh, like they're linked. And I think I've got just got more confident as well in my own like trusting my own imagination. And if, if I find a fact interesting or if I find something interesting to to play around with, I'm just going to going to push it rather than trying to have maybe a more a more standard way of writing. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so there's um yeah the, the the prologue is about is about the moon but it's also kind of setting the scene of of um of where i found myself for kind of a few months into to life in berlin um and um yeah there's an there's another chapter which is about uh um it's about the well, there's one that's about internet dating and about looking for raccoons. So it's those two things. And a few of those chapters, that if, you, if you read it, you'll see what these subjects are. And they kind of they kind of dance around each other and there's there's parallels and resonances. But I kind of a lot of the time want the reader to kind of draw their own links between these things rather than being too kind of prescriptive um, over over what these links are. And I don't always know how successful it is, but I want I really wanted to. I thought I was lucky enough to be able to write this book and I, I wanted to to kind of push myself artistically and, and try, out, uh, try out some new things. So maybe if, if you're thinking about how the styles change from the outrun, it's just, it's just taking it even further, I suppose, into the leaning into the strangeness of, of what interests me and, and the peculiarities of the, of the subjects that interest me, rather than just going for a, a kind of chronological sort of, sort of memoir. Um, if that makes any sense. <laughs> oh, completely, yeah. And I love that the the, um, the chapter in Berghain with the the underwater metal mm. is just absolutely amazing. Um, so um, unique. Um, did you, when you were kind of setting out to write to write the book, um, and and kind of through the book, there are um, these kind of big ideas and themes about kind of loneliness and alienation and kind of the complexities of um online dating and um did you while you were through the process of writing it did different um questions and patterns and ideas kind of come come out or or are you I always think of like Rachel Cusk says she has this idea and she performs it when she writes it was it like that for you or did things come out that you kind of weren't expecting through the writing process um I think whew, I tend to work like I have all these different documents <laughs> and there's different subject areas that I'm interested in and I gather all pieces of material about about that different um different subject um uh like I've had a whole file that's about um about stone and working with stone and then I realized that that's a lot there's a lot of material about light and the sun <laughs> um and but then then also I've got my diaries and I think then when I come to sort of write I can maybe combine these sort of my diaries with the kind of stuff that I've gathered the fragments and and things that interest me um but I guess that's nice writing there are things that will recur like there's quite a lot of times this kind of I cut a lot of it out at the end, but this kind of I question about invasive species versus native native species and why this keeps coming up. And I think, why is it that these kind of native species interest me? Uh, um, uh, invasive species interest me, including the grey lag geese in Orkney who, are, who I've written about. Um, so then I'll just sit down and I'll kind of riff like longhand in my diary about trying to get to the root of, of what is it about um, and maybe out of that riffing, I'll just get like a few couple of lines that's sort of the nugget of the of the truth of 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 what what's kind of been at the back of my mind. So I guess that's part of the way that I work. Um, uh, rather than having a plan from the beginning, but certain things, certain things emerge and then I try and try and riff around them until I find why. <laughs> Um, I'm going to ask you to read in a minute. Before I do, um, did you have a sense when you were writing of it, it how kind of electrifying it is? Like, <laughs> was that a conscious? Because it, it kind of felt like, in a way, you know, when when you're reading online and the kind of screen is keeping you, 
you know, um, kind of locked in, I kind of felt like I, it was almost alive. Like, did you, did you have a sense of that when you were writing it? Was that a thing that, you, was that a kind of effect you were trying to go for? Hmm. Um, I, I definitely had in mind that I want it to be a pleasurable experience for the reader and something I would like to read myself. And I go through a lot of editing in which I try and cut out the, the 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 chaff I try and just keep the most um I mean it's a short book it could have been longer because I feel like I did kind of hone it to the most the most powerful bits and um and also I think it is influenced very much by being online and twitter and these uh, writing quite succinctly and and you know just in three sentences that end on a bang <laughs> and the way that I do on Twitter and I think we're used we're used as to as readers reading like that and um, I kind of wanted to credit the reader with with not always having to have the filler like being able to sort of leap from one subject to another and not having to being able to join the dots themselves just like Giving, a, giving this strong image here and giving this sort of slightly absurd, um, you know, uh, sort of thought here and the, and the reader sort of join, joins the dots. So yeah, maybe if you, if you find it kind of powerful, those are some of the, the thought processes that, that went into it. Definitely influenced by, by online literature, culture, and, and by poetry, I think, is, you know, by poetry and song lyrics as, uh, as much as, um, more kind of academic work, I, I would say. Um, uh, so it's very subjective and it's, it's much more, I would say, about sort of like the mood and the, and the experience of reading it than it is at all about being a, a kind of comprehensive guide to my subjects. You know, if you want that, you, you can go el elsewhere for that. Uh, Fascinating! It's the instant, literally. It's yeah. like the instant. Um, will you read for us? Um, I think you were going to read the prologue. Um, we'd love that. And um, everybody, uh, I will go. We, I will go back to continue chatting to Amy. But then you will have a chance to ask her questions. So um, do put your questions in the Q and A as well. Um, and yeah, I'm going to hand over to Amy now. Mm -hmm. Uh, prologue February Hunger Moon I've been getting text messages from the moon a note flashes on my phone asking if the moon can track my location and I consent I've moved to a new city but the moon is following me around it texts to tell me when it will be out through the windows of my flat in Kreuzberg, there's just a parallelogram of sky at the top of the courtyard, only a small space to catch the passing moon on certain clear nights. B said that people move here just so they can tell their friends back home they're living in Berlin. B said that people moving here often feel like they've dropped several years that they can extend their youth. The app uses my location to tell me the moon's phase, direction, distance at all times. Right now, the moon is 384,012 miles away from my hand, which is holding my phone close to my heart as I sit at the table in the narrow kitchen of this flat with tall windows in an old style apartment block, stinging nettles by the front door. I'm just home from work, vibrating with tiredness. The moon is waxing gibbous and is 25.2 degrees above the horizon, almost due east. It rose just after midday and will set around 3 a.m. I run a bath, consult my digital charts, then wait for the moon. My bath is next to the window and I open it wide to the cool air. I can hear stray cats mewing in the stairwell, magpies rattling in the bare trees, and the indistinct rumble of the city that reminds me of the wind back home. My first sight of the moon is its reflection in my opposite neighbor's window, a bulbous glow in a double glazed mirror. Over the evening, it passes like a distant ship. I keep going back to the window and I'm thrilled to catch its oblivious light. In the stairwell, there are 
political graffiti and signs, anti-gentrification, pro-refugee anarchist. The building used to be squatted and there are some communal elements between the flats, shared Wi-Fi and handyman. I, I hear the neighbors around the courtyard, sex and arguments in various languages. Someone playing the flute, a, a baby crying. Every 1st of May, there's a big techno party in the courtyard. It's electric around here. The internet is hectic and I go to the moon to relax, opening new browser tabs for the moon's Wikipedia page and Google Maps of its surface. I follow new lunar developments from NASA. I learn that the moon was probably once part of the earth sheared off by an asteroid. B, who moved from Scotland to Tasmania, tells me that there is a different moon in the Southern hemisphere. It waxes and wanes in the opposite direction. I learn that the moon is slowing down the Earth's rotation. The moon is holding on to us. I grew more aware of the moon, and in particular, its effect on the tides when I was back home on the island. Low tide at new moon is the time to dig for shellfish called spoots on the beach. And after full moon is the time to go looking for things washed up, driftwood and treasure at the high water line. My street and the few surrounding are a mix between different areas of Kreuzberg, corner shops, Turkish bakeries, a garage selling revolution equipment next to a sushi place, high concept coffee shops and designer boutiques. There are clothes piled on the pavement for anyone to take for free and also places selling dresses for a thousand euros. People on the internet ask questions. What is the moon made of? Why can I see the moon during the day? Why is the moon red? Can the moon be destroyed? I've been wearing long skirts and fingerless gloves and painting my nails like I used to. I've been going to parties. In the English language bookshop, I read aloud from the Odyssey while two Norwegians played synth. I've run away, but I find the moon everywhere I go. I found a tiny pink plastic crescent in Tempelhofferfeld, a huge park in the middle of the city, right there on the footpath. In my first week in the city, I found a beautiful lunar calendar in a bookshop and have it blue tacked to my wall. Twice a month at new and full moon, I await Zizigy, the instant when the moon, earth and sun are aligned. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just gonna blow my nose. <clears throat> the lunar cycles are almost all I have in my diary for the year. My future is blank, but I know what the moon will be doing. There will be 13 full moons in the coming solar calendar year. The full moons of each month and season have different traditional names. February's full moon, full moon is the hunger moon and March is known as the lentern, wem, worm or sap moon. These names come to us from various cultures, Native American, Celtic, Anglo-Saxon, but are all tied to the seasons and the agricultural year. The moon has now passed over the courtyard and behind the buildings, but I'm looking at photographs of it online. I closed Twitter, the dating app, the eBay listings. Luna mosaics are created by hundreds of different image frames taken through a telescopic camera, added together to create a highly detailed picture of the moon's surface, textured craters, mountains and cliffs. They are magnified, monochrome and glowing. It's February and the city is dim, but I'm madly seeking moonlight. I've been in Berlin for four months and have lived in five houses. I've been cycling over cobbles. I've been keeping my devices charged, wearing shorts I found on the pavement. I've been sitting outside spatey corner shops, drinking, smoking roll-ups, drinking club mate, watching attractive and strange people on the street. I had a love affair that lasted for two nights and two afternoons. People in this town can't commit to anything, but the moon is always orbiting and the months pass relentlessly. I don't speak the language, but I know der Monde. My attachment to the moon grew during the years I've been lonely, and so did the moon's attachment to me. The moon, I tell B, is my boyfriend. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it was beautiful to hear you read. Thank you. Um, the instant is um, very romantic and, and intimate and 
and also erotic, which is uh, unusual in writing <laughs> about the natural world. Not wanting to pigeonhole you as nature writing, but you know, it can be quite a buttoned up um, <laughs> area. But finally, some sex in nature writing. Um, why was it important to include this aspect of life and, and, and what was it like writing about? Ooh, um, um, I think, I guess I work a lot from my diaries and, uh, you know, my diaries are full of, um, as well as talking about the birds that I saw that day or people that I met or interesting things they told me. It was full of a lot of uh, longing, desire, sexual frustration, um, and, you know, all these kind of um, human feelings. And that was really, you know, the major thing that, that concerned me at that time. And, um, and is what I had all this material on and I kind of felt that if this is my kind of obsession, this is my world, you know, as I talked about growing in confidence, I think maybe that's what other people are gonna, are gonna that's what interests them as well, you know? Um, and, you know, and I had this material that was about, um, about look at uh, finding traffic islands. So I've had this project, which was about looking at the map, finding all the traffic islands, which are like in the middle of roundabouts in Berlin and sort of going to visit them, which was a project that I had with my, with my boyfriend at the time. So writing about this was also a way of writing about this, this love affair. Um, and, um, you know, I thought I, I thought I thought it was some good material. So that and and then, um, you know, what what followed after that was uh, I wanted to write about how you know the relationship affected me because that was something that I really struggled with and and um, it was kind of an obsession and somewhere that I was stuck in and. Uh, you know, I wanted to be honest about that, I suppose. Um, and I guess also I'm interested in writing about, you know, writing about animals, but I wanted to write about the kind of animal parts of being human and about sort of human nature and about the internet, but also how the internet kind of amplifies our instincts. These are things that really interest me. Um, so, yeah, all these things are all, all t tied up together for me, and I, and I, you know, and you know, I, I've, put, I've put a lot of um, a lot of research into into longing and into heartbreak in my life. You know, I've, uh, I'm quite an expert in it. I've spent, I've spent I've spent a lot of time and energy, so I wanted to um, to uh, to honor that by writing about it and use that by writing about it, make good of it. You know, <laughs> um, I feel that the the internet is, is, is very much about connection you talk about the 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 animal nature in us and you say in the book you wanted to connect to the animal in you um and I think one of the most exciting things about um your work and this book is is how you blend kind of the human and the nature um and the natural world and the city and through examples of connection um between yourself and the elements such as swimming or stone letter writing really kind of unusual ways of thinking about a relationship um noticing the stone carvings in a city um and and you also give us kind of fresh ways of um connecting um with the with the rest of nature through your research and, and your learnings that you share with us um it is also it's also hard to read the instant um post-brexit without a kind of sad sense that we're now disconnected from Europe and the digital nomad lifestyle that you um, tried wouldn't really be possible now. Um, and it feels to me that you, you're you kind of making a point about connection, but not, not in a kind of didactic or obvious way. Um, and I wondered, it, it, I don't know, it feels like in your craft, you, you have this ability to kind of blend um, uh, the human animal and the, and the rest of nature um, so well. Um, how far do you think our kind of current predicaments um, are because of a kind of dualistic thinking that we have where we separate? I mean, even the phrase nature writing, because we separate humans and nature and we have this, we're living in this kind of lost kinship um, with, with the rest of the, the natural world. Is that something that um, kind of feeds into your thinking or? <clears throat> um, 
Um, what do I think? Um, um, I guess I've, I've worried that it's sort of a, a trivial thing to be to be writing about, um, you know, my kind of relationships and 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 desires. But then it, I, I think it's, um, you know, I think why am why am I not writing more kind of directly or explicitly about uh, kind of politics or or climate or. Um, uh, you know these things, but of course everything is is kind of political, or and you know there's the, the the backdrop to what I'm writing about is uh, uh, is politics, or is what was happening with Brexit, and I was quite aware at the time that I was, you know, I was really lucky to be have this freedom to go and live and work in different countries while other people from different countries couldn't, and also I'd, I had this freedom as a sober person, and I wanted to take advantage of, of these these great privileges that that, that I had. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, but be going about these, <laughs> these things, but and also in the backdrop of that, of the aware, of the awareness of the animals, is the knowledge that, um, you know, species are, are declining and, and to, to kind of appreciate them while we can and um, uh, and to and you're not going to realize that things are getting lost unless you kind of notice them notice them in the first place um, so I guess these are some of my excuses for not kind of not kind of writing about more more weighty issues but it's all it's all intertwined and um, you know everybody people, who are displaced or, or refugees, they're going to be going through heartbreak as well. Or, um, uh, you know, it's not, you know, it's it's human it, and heartbreak is a, one of the biggest things that nearly everyone goes through. Like I wrote about alcohol addiction and that's not, you know, that, that affects like a smaller amount of people, but, but kind of longing and uh, kind of, um, uh, what's the word, um, infatuation or, or heartbreak of these things that, you know, they're very, very common experiences. And um, yeah, those are, those are some garbled ideas around that, around those subjects. And you, but you, and you also write so astutely and, and quite bodily about loneliness. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and then, and I don't, I don't want to give away any, anything because most people won't have read the book, but something very painful happens to you, which you then must recover from. Mm. Um, one of the things that, that you say helped was the earth. Um, can you talk about that uh, in the kind of the context of away from Orkney, kind of how, <clears throat> how did that help you recover from this crisis? Um, and also how did writing about it help? Was, is it cathartic for you? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that some of the things that I learned through getting sober and by, uh, you know, becoming more interested in in birds and 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 the natural world and how that helped me, a kind of lessons that I have to keep having teaching myself again and again, you know. Um, and when I found myself quite quite sort of unhappy and, and bewildered and in pain again, it was the same same sort of process of of feeling awful but kind of tr trusting that if I allow other things to to kind of enter uh, enter the absence that has been created that that a new way forward is going to come so um I started learning a bit about um about stone letter carving um <laughs> uh, just sort of thinking this is inter this interests me I don't quite know why it's like the kind of fusion of geology which I'm interested in and maybe poetry because it's writing letters so I had had a lesson and then got these two chisel and lump hammer and started kind of um uh hammering away in in my back garden and uh you know while being super unhappy but just kind of thinking I'm allowing you know I'm not quite sure what's going to stick but I'm going to go out for I'm going to keep on doing my traffic islands project I'm going to I'm going to try all sorts of other things. I'm going to go to 
in the park and meet up with a bunch of hippies for a eye contact um, afternoon where you go and stare at strangers for like five minutes a piece. And uh, I guess it's that openness to experience and um, uh, and and outside let, letting things come in from the outside to heal, whether that be the very the elements, I think, is something that I realize are are always going to be there and are of of interest to me I think because of where I grew up but and you know the weather and the rocks and the light you know just these very basic things and enjoying them and noticing them and the combinations of them are something you know I think that's a theme running through the book and something that I kind of return to in my in my work and in my life. <laughs> Brilliant um I'm, we've got so many questions coming in, so I'm going to ask one more and then move um, <laughs> on to audience questions. Um, I I wanted to to ask you a bit, kind of go back to when you started writing. I think you started writing your diary when you were eight. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in the in the instant, you talk about art and you describe it as people making their mark. Um, and it feels kind of like in, in writing the instant, you, you kind of have put something into stone. And um, I wondered, kind of, has the, is your impetus to write the same as it was when you were eight um, or however old you were? How has, um, what does, why do you write now? What does art mean to you? Um, is the impetus different? Hmm. Um, I think it's one of the chapters in the book where I kind of, I kind of come to a conclusion that what I've what I'm fearing is being lost. I, I fear being lost and being forgotten about. Um, and I think writing about my life is a way a kind of way to kind of mitigate things being lost. I want to I want to capture them. And like if something happens to me and I don't manage to write about it or I don't I miss writing my diaries for a few days, I feel like, oh that was wasted. You know, I haven't gathered it. I haven't I haven't synthesized it. So um and I think it's, it's quite sort of megalomaniac, megalomaniacal. Um, uh, you know, that I want to be, I want to be remembered and noticed, and to make something of that. But I think that's maybe a maybe a motivation of of artists or uh, throughout time, or um, I guess to it's creativity, isn't it? It's to it's to make something where there was nothing, or to make something out of everyday life or common experiences to kind of elevate them, and to make something beautiful. Like very broadly, would be a kind of motivating, motivating factor. Um, yeah, it's kind of sift my experience to 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 find the beauty in it, and to to um, you know, I kind of think as a as a writer that's kind of your job it's not just about um uh I'm not, quite sure, not quite sure where I'm going with this thought but yeah to, to elevate things I suppose um I think I think that motivates me <laughs> uh when I was eight I think I was more just like the idea of having a secret notebook that other people couldn't read and I like that kind of like aura about and I, yeah the, this the idea that I had thoughts that were and I think this is what writing's about as well it's about when when you meet someone on a normal conversation, you would never know the kind of depth of their experience and how they see things. I think literature is really the way to show most fully the way that we kind of see the world and all the, the idiosyncrasies about, about us and you know somebody else's experience of living in Berlin for a year and the things that they would choose to notice and write about would be completely different from, from mine. And um, I think literature is the, the best way of doing that, so. There are some of my thoughts about that. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Okay, we have so many questions. I'm going to try and get through as many as possible. Um, so um, let's start. Do you feel torn between privacy and your public persona? And where do you seek solitude? That's from Lucy Cahoon. Um, uh, yeah, I think maybe it can be slightly because I do write about myself and also I put things online on social media. It can almost be an illusion that I live quite publicly, but I think actually the things that I choose to put in the book or online are very, you know, carefully selected and they're really only um, a, a small part of, you know, everybody's life is incredibly multifarious and, 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 um, 
vast and complex. So I think it's that element of um of of control and, and selection and uh, um uh what was it where where do I find solace was the word? Solitude. Sol solitude, solitude. Um where do I find solitude? Um uh yeah, I think <laughs> I get out I get out by myself um um as much as I can so I think yeah I think what I choose to put public is quite carefully selected I think that that would be the, the answer to that and I have um and you know a writer's life is pretty a lot of, uh, is a lot of solitude really um but yeah sometimes um I you know I take a little while off the internet or um or uh you know, there's a lot of what's in my diaries that doesn't uh, get uh, get uh, moved on to something that's for publication as well. Um, Tanya is interested to know, do you feel to be working in the lineage of any writers, past or present, do you keep particular authors near to hand, I mean, as you write for company? Ooh, um, nice question. This is always where my mind goes blank when people ask me for particular recommendations, and I and I think of things um, afterwards. But also, there is a seems to be a lot of good nonfiction kind of nature writers from America. Um, a lot of them are are like women that are older, quite a bit older. Um, uh, uh, I love um, Annie Dillard. Uh, her books have been um, really inspirational. Um, and um, uh, Gretel El Elric, um, uh, and um, I hope, <laughs> and I will think of more names. I'm so, uh, but I, I, yeah, I think I look to um, yeah Rebecca Solnit. People like, like American essayists. They just seem to be like whoa, like so so much um, so so much good stuff. Uh, so if I could sort of in any way be taking steps in in those kind of the the careers um of of those types of women writers whose work you know ranges from the very personal to the very political and and wide you know you know i think just because i've written this book which is very subjective i hope that um i've got it in me to do some other types of types of work as well <laughs> Um, okay, Anonymous says, what is the trickiest part of the writing process for you? Trickiest? Yeah. What's the trickiest part? Uh, trickiest part? Uh, well, probably just get, getting down to it in the first place, getting that first draft down. Um, uh, you know, once I get going, I'm all right. But um, uh, And then, you know, these, this isn't any, but just overcoming the the kind of self-doubt and the, the the voices in my head that's going you know who do you think you are to be putting your thoughts into the world or you know everything's this is all cliche this has been done before you know I've, I've, I've learned in a way to kind of put those things behind me so yeah the procrastination and the self-doubt and the blank page which are there's nothing kind of new about that but um uh and then there are elements at the other end of the process when it comes to like making the final decisions about cutting things out and you know what letting it go at the end as well so but start starting and ending maybe and then what I, what I like is the middle the editing and the redrafting I I'm happiest there fascinating um um, another would like to know, would love to know when the events in the book took place, how much time did you need to reflect on the events of the book and turn it into something cohesive? <laughs> um, yeah, it was a good few years ago now that I was in Berlin, like five, six years ago. So, <laughs> um, uh, so it's taken a long time for various reasons to, to get to this point. Um, um, but I'm glad that, I, I think that's good because I have that combination of this, what I what I note down at the time, so the real kind of raw sensory intensory intense intense um, parts of it, but then with time I'm able to be a little bit more to craft and to bring some distance and and to have a little bit more um, uh, more kind of detachment from the material. So that's been quite good, uh, but also it's just. Um, 
you know, I've had two children in the intervening time between the events of this book and it being published. So that's a major reason that it's taken so long. And also I think a reason that slightly to do with the, uh, the, um, the, the, the structure of the book being quite fragmented, I think perhaps, you know, is because uh, I've, it's been worked on in lots of, I, you know, I kind of can't believe it's got finished in a way because of the, the, um, the small, parts of interrupted time that it's um that it's been worked on in <laughs> Fab. um uh, Hattie Ellis says can you talk a bit more about the difference in connections to nature in the city and in the country whenever there's a full moon I long to be beside the sea rather than in London in London I watch the fewer buds more hungrily hmm. well I assume like when I was living on Pape, when I walked around, when I went out for a walk, I'd have my senses like really open, like just trying to notice anything of interest and, and take it all in. Um, but you, in the city, you can't be as, in my, in my view, as kind of open to everything because there's too much stimulation. You have to sort of focus in a little bit more because you, um, I remember once like leaving Pape and getting a, plane down to London and like walking around my eyes wide open and I just felt like I was like overstimulated or stoned or something because it was it was too much so you've got to kind of like focus in a bit more um so that but that was where I found it quite if I decided that I was going to look for goshawks and that would kind of give me a focus rather than looking at the advertising or or the people or the shops or something so maybe you'd have got to be a bit more focused in the city I don't know if that's um if that's correct uh but that's <laughs> great um what advice or suggestions would you give to writers to develop their craft in narrative non-fiction um what have you got craft um well i guess to try and try and get things finished even if it's just to begin with like a short piece like a blog post or um like a short article, like, but if you, maybe to try and get it finished or published in some sort of way, because then you're having to, you're having to tie it up, you're having to, to kind of, um, uh, to finish it, even if it's all, oh, I mean, writing is never, it's, it's never kind of as good at the end as you imagine it's going to be, or it's never, you're never completely pleased with it, or always things you can change, but actually kind of, kind of forcing yourself to, to get things done that <laughs> not procrastinating I suppose because sometimes you find that what you what you write is what you always were going to write so just go for it um uh, develop your craft but, I don't know try out different things read read a lot see what um you know uh, my sort of guiding principle for this book was like it, it would be something that I would like to read so I actually wrote sort of a list of like things I was really into like writers or not just writers but like poets or people working in audio or even illustrators that that really I connected with with for some reason and I and I would look at that to kind of like inspire me so think about think about what it is that you actually like or what interests you and if you don't know read some more um yeah <laughs> um you mentioned poetry and there is a question about um which poets uh what sort of poetry or poets are you inspired by if you can share any more on that um uh i think um i mentioned there was a few years ago there was kind of an online boom in poets working working on twitter and online called alt lit this is like quite a few years ago but i feel i think that was quite inspiring because they just wrote about the internet a lot and used the internet as a character and as something valid uh artistically um so that was quite influential um and one of the poets to come out of that is someone called Hera Lindsay Bird who's kind of sort of an absurd but like not absurd she's just quite an unusual voice uh and there's another po poet called Crispin Best who kind of emerged out of that scene and I don't know people that are having like uh, there's another poet called uh, Ross Sutherland um who does quite a lot of um uh experimental stuff works in audio as well uh, um so those are some names of people that i think are good <laughs> great um 
Lucy Cahoon says, just to let Amy know that Outrun is the book I recommend and then the most, also a Scot and a fellow wild swimmer. And um, we have another question about um, uh, cold water swimming. Um, oh, let me see, where did it go? Um, excuse me, where's it gone? Here we go. Did you miss cold water swimming? It seemed to be a big part of your life in Orkney. I think you still do it, don't you? Hmm. Um, well, in Berlin, I certainly, I don't write about it that much in the book. I think I feel that maybe I've written about, about it before or other people have written about it. Or, um, But there are loads of lakes in Berlin, like hundreds. Um, and I I swam often and in the River Spray. Uh, so I mentioned it a few times in the book and it was something that, that I did in Berlin and was important to me and continues to be um, important to me. Um, now so you know i think it's a motivating factor for wherever i've lived that the fact that there's places to swim uh so while it wasn't the atlantic ocean anymore uh it was the the freshwater lakes uh um of berlin and brandenburg uh i kept on going yeah definitely <laughs> it's a good place it's a good city if you're into that kind of thing Great. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. So just one more question, um, which is very exciting um, subject. How do you feel about having the outrun being turned into a film? And have you been involved in the screenplay? <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, it's amazing. I mean, it's kind of almost like a fantasy of what would happen um, uh, when you write a book. However, then when the fantasy becomes reality, you actually stop and think, oh, is this actually what I want? And then I did, you know, I carefully considered before I um, you know, sort of allowed the option to be to be taken for for people to um, to to adapt it. Uh, but the reason that I chose to work with the producer that I have been is because she was very sensitive to, to me and having me involved in the process. And I have been working with um, very closely with um, the director writer, uh, Nora Finkshead, who's actually German um, in, uh, in adapting the book for screen. And I've been seeing the drafts of the screenplay at all different stages and contributing some parts of it. And um, uh, it's been a really, um, uh, enjoyable and kind of mind-blowing process that <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to sort of detach myself a bit from the fact that it was my real life in order to like just make it good um, uh, but yeah occasionally when I do stop and think whoa um, it's uh, it's pretty crazy <laughs> uh, and, and still very much uh, on uh, in progress you know it's uh, but hopefully um, uh, it will be shooting in Orkney in the in the summer, yeah, and in Pape. <laughs> so exciting. Um, I'm sorry to people who we didn't get around to doing your questions. Um, there's some nice messages for you, Amy, in the, in the Q&A if you want to check them out. Um, thank you for your fantastic answers and sharing so honestly with us, Amy, and for all your brilliant questions. Everybody get this book, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hand over now to Daisy. Thank you, Lucy. Lucy, that was brilliant. Thank you for such an extraordinary interview. And um, Amy, congratulations on the instant. It's out now. It was so special for us to be able to celebrate with you in the launch week for the book. Um, signed editions are available from Newham Bookshop, and I hope that everyone listening will get a copy. Um, the podcast and the catch up link will be coming very, very soon. And Lucy Jones is Losing Eden is also out now. Um, and to... <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow we have a special event with Rathbone so I wanted to flag that if anyone would still like to register the tickets are available on 5by15.com um, but we will see you all very soon those were an extraordinary um, list of questions that came in it was a fantastic event and we were thrilled to be able to organize it this evening so thank you from all of us at 5 by 15 and good night we will see you again soon <laughs> thank you Thanks, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs>